Hello everyone, sorry about that. Uh, I hope you're all well. Uh, welcome to the first Dragonfly Day programme of 2021. I hope you're all doing well. Uh, my name's Beth and I'm a fourth year mechanical engineering student at the University of Southampton. And I'm also a volunteer with Invent Plus, which is a subgroup of Southampton Hub. Now, Southampton Hub itself is a subgroup of Student Hubs, which is a national charity that tries to encourage social action from students. So students run their own volunteering programmes. And here in Invent Plus, we specifically work to get students like yourselves more interested in engineering. So we run, we run different programmes that introduce you to different types of engineering. Now this year we've had to do things slightly differently. Normally we'd be coming into schools, but this year we've had to move everything online, which is where some of you, which is why we have the events like this, and is also where some of you will be getting our packs to try some different types of engineering out over the next few weeks. Now this year we have also partnered with Dragonfly Days, who are a group that work through the University of Southampton. They are also an on-campus uh, program who invite year nine female students to come to the University of Southampton campuses, come and look around our labs and try out some different types of engineering and see what aspects of STEM they might be interested in. Now, if you haven't heard of that before, STEM stands for science, technology, engineering and uh, maths. So it encompasses all different areas of science and technology. Now, before we start the session today, we just go through a little bit of housekeeping. So this is the first session from Dragonfly Days and it will all be online. Um, we're going to have a talk from our lovely speaker, Dr Nisreen Alwan, who I'll introduce a little bit more in a moment. Um, but we will have a talk from her and then followed by a Q&A session. So some schools have already sent their questions in, but if you haven't sent your questions in already, you will be able to send them in during the talk. If you look on the right hand side of the screen, there should be a chat section there where you can send in your questions. If you do send in a question and you don't see it straight away, don't worry, the questions do come through on a slight delay. The questions will come through, but we do ask that you don't keep asking the same questions, otherwise it'll just block up our chat box and we won't be able to get through as many. Now, this session is being recorded and the recording will be made accessible to all of the schools after this session is complete. So you will be able to go back and watch this session again if you'd like. But now all that's left for me to do is to introduce our speaker, the wonderful Dr Nisreen Arwen. Now, Dr Arwen is an Associate Professor of Public Health at the University of Southampton and is also an Honorary Consultant in Public Health at the University Hospital Southampton. Now, she's done some amazing work. She's been recognised for this work with an MBE and was most recently in the Queen's New Year's Honours List in 2021. She was also listed in BBC's 100 Women List in the in uh, 2020, which is an incredible honour. And throughout her career, she's also given different talks and lectures across the world. Uh, she's been featured on BBC Radio 4. Uh, she even has her own Wikipedia page. So I'm sure we can all agree, anyone who's got a Wikipedia about themselves has clearly done some incredible work in their life. Now, normally Dr. Arwen works in maternity care, so she is looking after the health of mother and baby and looking out for the long term health of pregnant women. But more recently, she has been working uh, with the public health response of the COVID-19 pandemic and also has been focusing primarily on long COVID and making sure that that is recognised in all of the statistics. But that's enough for me. Now I'm going to hand over to Dr. Nisreen Arwen, who you'll hear some wonderful things from. So. Thank you. Please take it away, Nazreen. Unmute. Thank you so much for this lovely, lovely introduction and thank you so much for inviting me to come and talk today. Um, I'm really glad and honoured to come and speak to you. And what I plan to do is just talk a bit about my journey, I suppose, you know, where I started from, um, you know, the research I do and then something about, you know, what we did during the pandemic. Um, and then and then we I can take questions from people if they if they like. Um, so um, I think I'm going to start with where I'm um, from. I'm originally from Iraq. Um, this is where I uh, did my schooling and then uh, went into medical school there. I'm from the uh, capital of Iraq, Baghdad. Now, when I when I was growing up, um, Iraq had some difficult circumstances. There were wars really throughout most of my childhood. 
that didn't mean that I had, uh, you know, a bad childhood. I mean, obviously, you know, the, you know, uh, there were good periods and there were bad periods, uh, but uh, it was um, it was um, not a very stable time, uh, shall we say, uh, during that period uh, or in that country, and it still is very sadly um, in that part of the world. So um, I did my schooling there. So um, you know, at your age, you know, I suppose the, the what well, you know, the, you, you you're listening right now. I was um, in school in Iraq, and actually, we one of the wars um, that had an impact on us, uh, and actually very similar uh, in a way of the school disruption we had with the COVID pandemic is um, uh, we had. Um, the, um, um, the the war uh, the, the the war I experienced, which was basically the coalition forces, um, had a, a war on um, Iraq um, in the 1990s, and we had to stop school for several months. Uh, I think I was in a maybe I think I was in the equivalent of year 10, maybe. Uh, and we had to stop. Uh, not only we had to stop school like everybody did uh, in the pandemic. But also we had to struggle with things like, you know, we had no electricity got uh, interrupted, so we had no electricity, the water supply um, had problems. So it was a really difficult time to go through during that stage um, or during that age. And I um, and it's really um, um, interesting that I connected back to my memories for that, you know, for, for that um, stage in my life with what happened in the pandemic. I've got three children at different stages in school. Uh, one is in college, uh, one is in secondary school, in fact year nine, uh, and then one in, uh, is in primary school and they all had the interruptions in the pandemic and there were a lot of you know stress um, and anxiety around you know what's going to happen now and how things will work um, and changes to the routines in life so I connected to that stage but um, I just kept on telling them, you know, it, 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 it'll be fine and there's an interruption now, but, you know, you are also learning things through this difficult time that would um, be helpful for you in the future. And this is this is what I learned from uh, what I've experienced. So just going back then, I finished my school. I went then into medical school, which is the which was the University of Baghdad in Iraq. Uh, and then medical school over there is six years. Um, so you finish. Uh, before, so so we don't have A levels. We have something called national baccalaureates, and you finish that, um, and then you go and you apply for um, university, and it, depending on your grades, um, you know, you know what what uh, what sort of you know uh, uh, degree you get accepted uh, for. You you can apply for several similar similar to here. Maybe you have three or four choices. Um, so I got into medicine and. Um, and, um, and and why did I choose medicine? I guess I um, the, the the choices back where I was are quite limited, I, or limited in the sense that uh, you know we didn't have the variety of courses that are available for you now. Uh, and if you were doing well in school, um, then the choices of actually getting into somewhere where you get a secure job. Um, is limited. So we used to think, you know, medicine, pharmacy, dentistry, engineering, uh, if you're into kind of the science path uh, pathway. Um, so I don't, I remember thinking a lot about my choice, uh, but I didn't feel torn because I didn't have millions of choices of courses to go to. go to. And then I decided to go into medicine and actually both of my parents are doc were doctors in Iraq. Uh, so I suppose that was a familiar career pathway for me to, to go for. Um, and then I um, did my um, degree and then after I finished my degree, straight after I finished my degree, I uh, came to the UK to do a master's course in public health and that was at the University of Nottingham. So I did that for a year. I went into public health because um, it really fascinated me in medical school because when you're in medical school, you're supposed to treat one patient at a time, make them better and, 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 and that really feels great. But the public health aspect means really looking at big groups of people and populations. So like what we've experienced in the pandemic, you know, if you do certain things or have certain policy, then you have health impact on a very large number of the population. And that fascinated me uh, because then it just meant like you can do more because you can, you know, your work can impact a, a big a bigger number of people and also I was fascinated by prevention because we used to see 
illness a lot ill people and i was always fascinated of how you could you could prevent the illness from developing in the first place so um so and that's what you know big part of public health is the prevention of illness um so i did the masters in public health and then i and then i um uh went back to kind of practicing medicine in a hospital setting for a few years um in different parts of the country so i went in but in birmingham initially and then i went to um leeds uh, in the north um and i did that you know i did clinical medicine so that's just practicing in the hospital for a few years and then i went back into public health and what happens in medicine is you after you graduate you go you work as a junior doctor and then um, and then you kind of go into specialist training programs. So whatever specialty of medicine you want to do, you then take that pathway and there's a specific training program that you apply for. And so there was a specific training program for public health medicine, and that's what I applied for. And when I was uh, doing that, a specific aspect of public health that I was really passionate about is the, is the science and the research of public health. So not only applying, um, the principles of public health and practice, but actually the discovery side of things, you know, what actually causes diseases and what prevents, what action can we do to prevent them and the research around that, these aspects really fascinated me. So therefore I went into um, the academic public health, so really going into university to do research in public health and that um, was, um, um, I did this the research specifically on an area um, called nutritional epidemiology, which means basically looking at how food um, shapes the health um, of people, you know, what we eat um, uh, in kind of epidemiology is basically the study of the distribution and the prevention of disease. Um, so this is what I did and I specifically focus in my PhD on, um, on the nutrition of the mother during pregnancy. Because there were research, there was research emerging at the time that actually is so important what mum eats during pregnancy, not only for the health of the pregnancy, but actually that could influence the health of the child later on, and that's not just at birth, but also um, later in life. You know, so there's so some sort of a programming that happens in the womb that can kind of set um, how much risk you're predisposed to. Um, um, later in life you know after you're born so this was really fascinating to me and i particularly looked at maternal nutrition so that you know what moms eat um uh, eats during pregnancy and how that's linked to the health of the child both immediately after birth but also later in life um so this is where i started you know focusing on this area maternal and child health um and after i finished my public health training and i finished my phd i came to the University of Southampton about six years ago now, uh, into my current position uh, where I am now. Um, uh, and I, so I'm working as an associate professor in public health. Um, and I continue the research in this area. And basically my research focuses on what can we change um, during pregnancy to make this journey healthier and better for mom and baby. Um, recognizing that um, you know you go a bit wider than food because then you recognize through doing the research that um, the choice of what we eat is determined by so many things you know where we live what what kind of uh, what access to food do we have uh, you know how affordable healthy food is um, and you know what what do we prioritize what else is going on in our lives that we prioritize cooking healthy meals um, or you know um, having certain types of food. So there's all this kind of bigger, bigger, lots and lots of factors determining nutrition. It's not a straightforward, you know, yes, I'll eat this or that. Um, so this is, so really we got, I got more into um, trying to research this and looking at all of these factors that can shape uh, nutrition, not only nutrition, uh, mainly I'm focusing, I focused in the uh, last few years on, on, on obesity. So, you know, what can we do to try and prevent you know, excess weight gain, uh, both for the mother and also for, for the child um, after that. So um, this is kind of was been my research area, um, but, and so 
looking at pregnancy, we did look at also some, you know, had some research around vaccinations and pregnancy, for example. Um, and um, then the pandemic came in March 2020 to the UK and me being in public health, I thought I really, we really need to kind of focus on what we can do uh, for the country in terms of responding to the pandemic. Um, so we, um, you know, we, we responded in, in different ways at the start of the pandemic. We, uh, I try, you know, tried to, uh, with other colleagues, try to gather um, other public health um, researchers and epidemiologists. So the people who were researching that, you know, kind of prevention of disease and pandemics and trying to put some having one voice about certain things like for example testing and masks and and you know what how lot how you know all the restrictions we have how effective they are um out of this work at the start something came out which is the, the we 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 tried to we uh, try started um designing the um a, a pilot study or a feasibility you know trying to test this uh weekly uh testing program for covid which some of you might know of uh, which is a saliva program where you try and put, um, uh, you know, you have a, a pot and uh, you, you basically have some saliva in the pot and then we test it and, and that's done weekly just to pick up any anybody with infection, even if they have no symptoms. So we piloted that in Southampton. But unfortunately, while I was doing all of that, I in March, uh, at the end of March 2020, I was also experiencing symptoms of COVID. Um, and these symptoms, although I got better, um, didn't completely go away. They kept coming back, which then at the time nobody knew what was happening. Uh, but we, w what we know now is called long COVID, which is basically people getting COVID-19, not necessarily getting it badly and not necessarily requiring to go to, to the hospital, but having it, but then not completely recovering from it. Um, and it kind of turns into a more of a long term um, illness or health issue where these uh, symptoms keep coming back. Um, and and you know maybe new symptoms developing. We, it's a new area really. We 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 need more research on um, other pandemics. Other viruses cause that as well. So when I say new, it's not completely new. The concept of having more a lingering illness after a viral infection is not new. We knew that from before and from other viruses, but the, specifically with COVID, we um, it's it's a bit of a a black hole in terms of we need to know exactly what's happening and what's the mechanism for this is. So I started working a lot on long COVID, basically starting at the start to kind of tell people this is happening and raising awareness and then and then base and, and then um, alerting the health services and the government that this is a problem that we need to be aware of. We need to count long COVID. We need to see how many people are getting it and how we can treated but also um lots of Im lots of implications for the prevention because we you know when when covid came the particularly for younger and healthier people the message was you know you're absolutely fine but you need to prevent those people who are more vulnerable uh, or uh, elderly people but actually we were seeing long covid in you know at all age groups and this is something that really needed um people needed to be aware of uh, because it was, you know, quite disruptive. Long, long COVID could be, you know, severity varies. It could be mild, but it also, you know, it could prevent people from working, doing their normal daily activities, um, and it could be quite disruptive. So we did a lot of work on long COVID. We did a survey trying to survey, you know, just understand what people were experiencing with long COVID um, and also get, getting involved in lots of awareness raising and even uh, contributing to the, uh, you know, to, to there's an all party parliamentary group, for example, which did the first debate in Parliament about long COVID back in January, which, um, you know, I gave evidence to so that uh, they kind of form what the priorities for long COVID are uh, in the pandemic. So um, it's been really, um, it's been a, uh, the last year has just been surreal for all of us. It's not, it's been, uh, you know, different for all of us. All our lives have changed in different ways. Um, but I think it, I'm, I think it made it very, very um, clear the role of public health and how we should really understand what public health is and means. And I think this is something that I'd like to focus on in the next, um, uh, the next stage of my career as well is, you know, I did a lot of public communication with people. I did a lot of, you know, explaining some of the concepts of public health to do with the pandemic. 
Um, and I think that that we need to do more of that because before the pandemic, people hardly knew what public health means, and we always had to explain what 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 is it, what is the job that we're doing, which is probably the same <laughs> same for some people now. But I think more people kind of maybe are receptive of it because they've seen what the pandemic does and what actually what actions such as prevention um, can can do. So if you get the public health right, you get the actions right, then actually then um, the way we suffered from the pandemic. Um, it, it could be shaped differently and some countries actually made different dif decisions um, in how they responded to the pandemic uh, at the start particularly and then they had different outcomes. So all of this is shaped by public health science um, and how we um, respond to big events, global events like that. Um, so yes, I mean, thank you so, so much. I, I got these on, it's the MBE, uh, I got it because, uh, you know, of the, I suppose, the, it was a great surprise, <laughs> the collective things that I did and the BBC uh, being listed on the BBC 100 women list as well. And it was just great to be acknowledged because it was just such a difficult year uh, for me and for others as well. And it was nice to be acknowledged in that way um, uh, because, you know, particularly that all of this work was not planned for or predicted. It was just basically, you know, feeling that there's a gap um, in terms of the knowledge, um, that I felt like it had to be filled. Um, so I stepped forward and started talking about these things. So I'm going to stop talking now and maybe there might be some questions that people want to ask me and I can expand on some of these things. Yeah, thank you so much, Nisreen, for talking us through all of that. Um, yeah, it was really interesting to hear all about your story there. Uh, we do already have some questions coming through. Um, so the first one is if you hadn't gone into medicine, what else do you think you would have worked on? You're still on mute there, Nisreen, if you unmute yourself there. Sorry, I don't know what happened there. Yeah, you can hear me? Thank you. So I I had initially, I had, I think, the dream of many of becoming a singer or a member of a, <laughs> a pop band. Uh, but then I quickly, did, you know, kind of uh, accepted that, you know, my voice didn't help. Uh, then I actually I really wanted to be a journalist. That's something I wanted to do to be, although it's not very similar to medicine, something different. Uh, but I really like the aspect of kind of, um, you know, interacting with a lot of people and um, and communicating things, which I think is is funny because I think that's that's a lot of what I'm doing now, and particularly in the last year, this is what a lot of the you know not typically journalists, but actually that sort of interaction and, and science communication. Um, and the advocacy work, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's an aspect that I particularly enjoy. So yeah, if I hadn't been, you know, who knows, maybe I can switch, uh, you know, switch careers, be a, be a public health slash journalist person. <laughs> well, it'd be a lot of work, but I'm sure you'd be able to manage it. <laughs> uh, the next question that we've got come through, um, what do you like to do in your spare time? Do you have any hobbies that you enjoy? Anything like that? Yeah, so I mean, I hardly have any spare time to be com completely honest with you, um, because I'm a mom as well, and you know, I need you know, I have my the, you know, looking after the household. Uh, but the hobbies I have is I love nature. Uh, I love um, you know going out for walks in nature. I, I love it, particularly with my family. Um, you know, love you know going to parks. Um, you know you know, looking after some plants, you know, in, in the garden. I, lo I love reading, uh, but I also, I think the thing I do most of, because it kind of, you know, it gives me that, you know, it's disconnection is I watch a lot of movies. Uh, and so I really enjoy watching, uh, watching movies or, you know, you know, really getting into some good um, fiction kind of, uh, you know, watching some fiction. So yeah, that that's what I do. These are my hobbies. Um, so they're not very exciting, but these are the things that kind of relax me uh, and I can disconnect from the job. Yep. Oh, we've got more. Okay. Yeah, we've got more coming through. Uh, so the next one is what public medical issue do you wish you could solve immediately? Oh, um, that's a difficult one. So I think I, I think the long I focused on long COVID and I think this is something that is immediate in my mind because I think it's uh, something we need to understand more. And there are lots of people there who haven't recovered from getting the virus. 
uh, completely and we need to understand how you know they can be cured but also i'm really passionate about preventing more people getting long COVID. um so um long COVID. but then also maybe the other big issue that i've researched many years on is is obesity to try and understand how we can strike the balance where we uh, are helping you know with you know preventing obesity but also not laying the blame on people about you know their weight because that's a very fine balance uh, and as i said we know very clearly that it's not a black and white issue and there are so many factors determining um you know obesity and overweight so just getting the getting the balance right in terms of um in terms of this uh, issue uh, this next one links quite well, actually. Um, do you think you've made any interesting or particularly recent findings? So do you think that uh, you've recently found any new interesting areas of research? Um, well, again, with long COVID, the long COVID work we did recently, we've, we, we, we found how people, what people are experiencing, what symptoms they're experiencing, what brings on their symptoms, um, you know, through the work, you know, and what relieves them and you know um how severe it is how it's affecting so really we, we see the description of this new phenomena that people are having and gaining much more understanding into um what what the patients are experiencing because that's the only way that you know we can tackle it it's a pretty large area of research to go through i'm sure yeah yeah uh, so the next one, um, what does a typical workday look for like for you and how long, it, uh, excuse me, uh, what, does, what are your typical working hours like and what does a typical day of work look like for you? So this is, um, this is um, a, a good, this is a good, I suppose not good and bad, so there's a good and challenging thing. So in, a, in kind of research and academia and I didn't even, uh, I didn't mention that I do teaching as well, so I teach mainly uh, postgraduate students so those who are doing masters and obviously I supervise PhD so there's a lot of teaching element it's flexible the good thing is it's flexible in that um, you know you could kind of fit in contrast to what I did before which is the clinical side of medicine uh, you obviously have to do your shifts and they're fixed and you know there was very little flexibility in the duties that you're doing and there's little control really in the duties that you're doing when you're on a you know medical shift um, but in, in, in research and academia, there's more flexibility, more control of your time. You can plan out what you're doing more. Um, so not I, I, you know, every day is almost different, really. Uh, and that's what attracted me to this area as well, because you can have you just have different activities and, and you don't feel bored because you've got this variety of activities and even the same activities look different from day to day um but i but that means that you there is a risk of you just do a lot because you know you do more and more and you know you get more projects and you get you know um you do more research you do more teaching you get more uh invitation you know maybe to talk or present you about your research uh more of you know your supervision of people so it just you know then becomes a lot of work and sometimes that's hard to juggle um so time the skills of how you manage your time and how you organize your workload is really really crucial in the in the job that i do are there any more sorry my, my internet cut out there for a second yeah. now uh, the next question a bit of a change of pace uh, so when you got your mba did you get to meet the queen no, um, unfortunately, so, what I did. Like? I oh, did it because oh, of the COVID, because of the pandemic. So we were told that when the pandemic is over, we'll get to meet the Queen. So let's hope so. I only <laughs> got it in in the, in the New Year, so I got it in you know January. So I'm still looking forward to that. At least you know you'll get the chance to, <laughs> hopefully in the near future. Uh, now, this next question is of personal interest to one of our organisers, actually. Um, but they've asked, is long COVID similar to ME or to chronic fatigue syndrome? Yeah, so, um, yeah, there are many aspects of long COVID that seem similar to ME uh, or chronic fatigue syndrome. Um, it might be that a, a subgroup, subset of people with long COVID have identical um, um, 
kind of presentation as MECFS um, because on COVID is, is an umbrella term so because it could be more than one condition happening to people under this lot, big umbrella that we're still trying to understand but the, the issue the difficulty is uh, chronic fatigue syndrome and ME are one of these chronic conditions that haven't been well understood and researched over the years and that then makes it even difficult to say even the, that condition itself we don't know exactly you know you know how what is what causes it and how it's treated and I'm hoping with the focus on long COVID that the pandemic brings maybe there's a silver lining that all of these other chronic conditions like ME and chronic fatigue syndrome will also be much more rigorously researched um, and then, then there'll be kind of more treatments um, effective treatments and um, you know that people you know that could be um, um, discovered really through it so yes, it is similar. That's a long-winded answer to your question. It, it is similar. Is it exactly MECFS? We, we don't know. It might be, you know, subgroup is, and but we need more studies. But actually, we're hoping any studies that, of long COVID would then be impact positively on on other these other conditions as well because of the similarity. Yeah, that's that's great to hear. Behind the scenes, everyone's very excited to hear that that this might actually have longer impacts even after the pandemic is gone. Yeah, it should. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, the next question we've got, what's your favourite thing about being a scientist? It's, um, it's just being able to come up with ideas and think about things and yeah, I just get so excited when I get ideas. Uh, sometimes a job actually takes you away from that because you're all you, you maybe overwhelmed, you know, you're overwhelmed. There's a lot to do there are all these tasks that you can you have to do but actually I c I, the research gives you that space of where you you need or you need you need to give your, that yourself that space where you just think discuss I mean you have an idea and you go and you get excited and you go and discuss it with your team you know the people who are also interested in the subject it could be in your university it could be in other parts of the country or even the world uh, and then you, you talking about it kind of builds that idea. And then when you see that idea building and the research building and the questions that could come out from the research and, and then how you do it, it's a very exciting, it's something I feel very excited about. Um, and um, yeah, I think that's what attracted me. But I also working in, in the university and academia, I really love um, mentoring um, more junior researchers. Um, and working with them and kind of also watching them, you know, grow as researchers, you know, their ideas and the research they do and become more independent. That I, I love that part of the job too. I've definitely had that same experience of getting the excitement over finding a new question to ask and trying to find that answer as well. So it's great to know that it's a universal thing. Um, the next question is, what barriers did you overcome to get to the place where you are now? Hmm. Uh, I think um, that there are barriers about being a girl, <laughs> uh, particularly from where I come from. But I think it's universal everywhere in the world that we um, sometimes some things and to establish yourself in certain areas and to reach certain places is still this. We still there's still um, issues with gender equality. Um, um, so um, and what people expect, you know, of scientists and, you know, um, the stereotypes that people are used to in terms of the job roles and that all affects career. So I think um, the barriers have been really, um, you know, maybe maybe trying to work hard and even maybe harder than other people to try and establish yourself um, in a certain uh, career path or to get a certain position. but. I think I think what helped me with barriers and what helps me still is to be open and talk about them uh, and then and then you would get to the experiences of other people as well um, and uh, rather than bottling them in and maybe feeling like oh I've got all these barriers and you know I'm just going nowhere because you get sometimes you get frustrated along the way many times and what helps me is to talk about it um, and to get the allies you know to get the people who understand and listen and and maybe even share the experiences and then through this you feel more powerful um, to overcome these barriers because you feel there are other people and there's a force uh, that you know other people also want to uh, overcome these barriers which are common you know they're not usually the barriers are not unique to you they'll be experienced by you know other people as well maybe people uh, who have similar experiences or characteristics as you um, 
so yeah i mean i think i think i mean the first barrier when i came to this country it was a different culture it was a different way of um, um, working and studying um, and in terms of the language uh, we study English uh, we study uh, medicine in Iraq in English so that wasn't such a big idea but obviously it, but the diff big big obstacle so I did speak English but I think it was just um, you know the way the way the culture and the way of life and even in, you know how you you know get your assessments and do your assessments and all of these things um, but yeah I think yeah, I think support is really, really important and, and, and not not kind of keeping the frustrations um, to yourself and try and, you know, share them with trusted people. You've clearly put a lot of work in to overcome some of the barriers, but I'm sure we're all <laughs> glad to see where you are now. <laughs> Thank you. Um, you did mention a little bit about um, your time in medical school there and some of the barriers you overcame. We've got another question here more about medical school. Um, so people are wondering um, how long you spent at med school and also what areas you specialised in while you were there. Yeah, so so in medical school, we, we studied for six years in Iraq. Here it's usually five years. Sometimes you uh, take some um, intercalated degree or something here. So about about similar period. Um, uh, and you just study in medical school, you study all of the specialties, uh, really kind of you, you do a bit of everything. And then once you finish medical school, um, you start thinking about what you want to specialize in. And the first few years of your clinical training, you also try, you, they rotate you like you would do a bit of, you know, you know, GP and then you might do a bit of hospital medicine. You might do a bit of pediatrics, you know, you might do a, a, a bit of surgery. Um, so you get a few months in each specialty and then and then after um, a, a couple of years or a few years, then you, you really have to decide what specialty you want to do within medicine. And then I went, that's when I went into public health. Right. Um, so the next the next question is coming from someone who looks like they might want to go into medicine. Um, are there any A-level subjects that you particularly suggest a student wanting to go into medicine takes? Yeah, so uh, as I said, I didn't, <laughs> I didn't do A levels here. However, I have um, a son who uh, was, was is thinking about going to medicine, and so we looked at the A level, uh, you know. And I think the ones that um, um, to take is, is, you know, I think that the, the the essential ones are biology and chemistry, and then you can obviously then take other A levels, you know, I think maths is desirable for some medical schools as well, but not necessarily all of them. Uh, you can take a language, that's a nice thing to take. Uh, and some medical schools really encourage you to do that, to take a, you know, um, a, a, a foreign language. Uh, but yeah, I think I think these are the essential ones are, I think, biology and chemistry. Yep. Uh, taking a step away from the medicine side now, uh, do you have any siblings? Somebody wants to know. Yeah, I've got two sisters who are younger than me. Um, so, and one of them is a doctor as well. And the other one is not a doctor, but a, a related um, area, which is a geneticist. So she studied human genetics at university. It runs in the family then. <laughs> the looks of it. Boring, boring. We don't have a, nobody ended up being a journalist, but maybe one of my children's will. <laughs> maybe one day. <laughs> Uh, so the next question, um, what is the most interesting project you've been a part of? Hmm. We did a, a part of my PhD, we did a project where we had to measure, um, we had to kind of measure the blood flow, how fast the blood flows in babies and newborn babies. Um, and that was very difficult and challenging, but it was also exciting because we interacted with all. This is a difficult, it's a really nice period of time to kind of interact with the research participants who were basically the mothers and their babies and trying to do this um, a study. Um, so that I think that was an exciting study. I think every research study, I the whole point, and that's part the nice thing about, about research is that you go into research because you get excited about every single research study that you do. Um, so um, um, and if you don't have that drive and excitement, then you know that you know, that affects how well you do the research in the first place. So every study I've involved in really is, there's been an excitement about it. Sometimes then things get complicated. We don't exactly, it doesn't go exactly as planned. 
uh, but the excitement, particularly, you know, while you're designing the research um, and, and even doing it is, is always there. OK, then this next question might be interesting, given how exciting all of your research sounds like it's been. Uh, somebody wants to know who is the most interesting person that you have worked with and why? <laughs> I don't know. It's interesting. I mean, my PhD supervisor, so I did a PhD and the, and the supervisor I had, um, she was really inspiring and very supportive. She's the one I, I would think who made me decide, um, not only decide to stay in research and academia or attracted me even to do the PhD in the first place, but she um, just gave me much you know, she gave me the space to be more confident and independent. So she had this great balance, which I think any anybody, you know, it, you'd be lucky to work with somebody like that. She had the balance of where she's not, she didn't, she didn't tell me exactly what to do. So she wasn't too overbearing or kind of dictating exactly what I do. She gave me a lot of space to create my own research and design it and you know do although I was a junior researcher at the time but she was so supportive and I know she was always there if I had a problem if I had a question uh, she always provided she was always very accessible approachable and would give me advice so she had that nice balance of like giving me my space and me feeling much more confident about doing things and achieving things and designing my own own studies but also being so supportive and really encouraging a lot all, all the time um you know encouraging encouraging me to do more and you know take take um you know take more decisions and be more independent so she had a big impact on that research career so i'll always be grateful for her and and i think it's very important in anybody's career to have that sort of mentor or the person who would guide you through um, and I think when you go into medical school, you know, med some medical schools also assign if you do go to medical school, maybe even any other specialist assigns to, to mentors or tutors and they, you know, can maybe provide that role of giving you that support and, and, and advice. So, yeah, uh, but I mean, I've worked with different uh, people. Um, interesting could be could mean different <laughs> things. I think even the people I didn't, um, maybe I found it a bit difficult to work with. Uh, when I reflected back, I've learned something from that relationship. Uh, I've learned, maybe I've learned how I should react better, uh, how I could do, you know, I, it, there's always learning in the difficult relationships. I think there is there is, um, there is a lot of learning, but sometimes you just don't realise it at the time. Well, your so supervisor sounds like she was a great woman to work under, but it also sounds like you've worked with lots of amazing people. Uh, yeah, shout out to her. She's her name is Professor Janet Cade. She's in Leeds, so she's amazing. <laughs> All right, quite a local one comparatively then. <laughs> Heard to uh, Baghdad. <laughs> um, we've only got a couple of questions left. Um, so, how many languages do you speak, and when did you learn them? Uh, well, I speak Arabic. That's my native language, and then I speak English. Uh, we start um, learning English uh, from primary school school in Iraq or at least we did when I was growing up there um, so 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 and then I've learned a bit of French along the way but I that's really bad now <laughs> I can I can understand a few words but not nothing more <laughs> what was the other question was there two questions there oh no um it was just when did you learn them so you answered that yeah yeah okay. it started learning English in primary school yeah but yeah. it's still good that you're able to speak two languages and now we've got the last question here. Might be the most important question for some people listening today. What football team do you support? Oh, oh my, oh, this is, um, I don't, this is gonna like disappoint a lot of people. I don't think I support any football team. I can tell you both of my boys support Leeds United. And one of them also supports Chelsea. Uh, but it doesn't, it doesn't mean I support them. All I, all I get is the shouts, you know, when there's a game and, you know, all the excitement about it. So, <laughs> so sorry, I don't support football team. <laughs> oh, I do I like watching football, but I think it's more kind of the World Cup football, you know, like what the countries play with each other rather than the club football. <laughs> I think we can excuse you not following football, given how busy you are with all of your research work. 
Uh, but thank you so much, Dr. Arwen, for taking the time to answer all our questions. And thank you to everyone listening today for sending in your questions. Uh, that is the end of our session today. So thank you all for taking the time to listen. Uh, if you do have any more questions, then speak to your teachers and they'll be able to send them through so that we can pose them to Dr. Arwen. Or if they're more generally about engineering, then we can also ask uh, some of the different Invent Plus members. Um, if you are one of the students that's going to be working on our packs, then you will also be able to ask your question through Padlet, both on the packs and more general engineering questions. Um, but for now, we're just going to hope they all go well for you. You'll have to keep us updated on those. Uh, our next live session is going to be on the 13th of May, which is a Thursday, and that will be a panel discussion with five panel members from lots of different engineering backgrounds. So we're going to have acoustical engineering, biomedical engineering and electronics engineering, as well as some students who are looking at universities now. Uh, but for now, thank you so much for listening. Thank you again to Dr. Arwen for taking the time to speak to us today. And we hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you very thank much. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye.